Good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks very much for joining us this morning. I'm hoping that you can all hear me okay. My name is it's, uh, Condi Nkosi. I'm part of the Schroeder's team here in Johannesburg. Joining me in our uh, London, uh, of, I was going to say offices, but we're all working from home. So joining me from London are Simon Adler and Liam Nunn, who are both fund managers in the Schroeder's value team. That team manages in excess of about 10 billion US dollars across uh, UK, European, and global mandates. The Global Recovery Fund being one of those global mandates. The format uh, for today will be a presentation where the team will provide you some context of what's been happening in markets and also they'll share with you some interesting observations from our value investors' perspective. We will then touch on um, a few points around how the team's positioned in the Global Recovery Fund. We have around 45 minutes in total scheduled for the session. As always, we aim to have these uh, sessions as interactive as possible, and we welcome you to ask as many questions as you can so we can make the most of the time we've got with Simon and Liam. You should see functionality in front of you uh, that will allow you to pop these questions through to the team. Lastly, please note that the webinar is being recorded, so if for whatever reason uh, you lose connection, you will be able to access the recorded version of it via the same link on which you used to join this webinar. Great. With that, I'll hand over to Simon and Liam. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Condi. This is Simon Adler here. Thank you all very much for your time today at joining us. We appreciate this situation is not easy, both professionally and personally, and so we're very grateful for the opportunity to update you on the Global Recovery Fund. Firstly, it's a great pleasure to be able to introduce Liam Nunn to you. He is now named as Deputy Fund Manager on Global Recovery alongside Nick Kirridge, Andrew Lydon, and myself. Liam started his career at Schroeder's, then ran value money at Merion, what used to be old mutual asset management, before joining us at the beginning of 2019. He's an outstanding analyst, fund manager, and communicator, has already been working on the fund, and we think he's going to make a very positive difference. I'm going to make some very brief opening comments around performance. Then Liam is going to cover the market reaction and the two big risks no one is talking about, and then I will discuss what we've been doing in the portfolio. As Condi says, we will ensure we leave plenty of time for questions and answers at the end. An opening comment on performance, though. The drawdown over the last few weeks has been large and clearly greater than we would have hoped for. We recognize that and wish to be upfront. It is very disappointing. I think it's worth making three broad comments around it, though. <clears throat> Firstly, as many of you know, we are totally aligned to our clients and feel the same performance personally. It's not what we would like. However, we think the future performance will be much, much better and more than cover what's happened. Secondly, we believe it's a consequence of two broad things. Firstly, value versus growth, which Liam will cover. Secondly, and related, are banks and commodity positions, which have been poor. We thought their significantly improved balance sheets would provide greater protection than the market has given them, and yet they've been aggressively sold. The market can be indiscriminate in these tough times, and we think these positions will deliver substantial future performance, but nevertheless they have been poor and we cannot hide from that. And thirdly, Schroeder's have had recovery funds for 50 years, and over that time, buying performance, buying after performance like this has delivered absolutely outstanding returns. So we think the opportunity is ripe here for the Global Recovery Fund and superb future returns. As the dust settles, the market will become more discriminate, which we believe will be of big benefit to the portfolio. 
We are seeing the best investment environment there has been for almost a decade and expect to deliver very, very good returns from here. Whilst it may feel uncomfortable and unnatural, this is the time to be adding to the fund. That's what some of our clients have done over the past few weeks, and it's what we're doing with our own money. With that, I'll pass over to Liam, who will cover markets and those two big risks. Over to you, Liam. Thank you, Simon, and good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I thought we should start by setting the scene and talking a little bit about what's happened in markets in the last month or so um, before we move on to the fund and, and what we're doing in this increasingly volatile environment. In terms of the initial market behavior in response to the unfolding crisis, the way I describe the market's reaction is dramatic, but quite one-dimensional thus far. I'll come back to what I mean by one-dimensional shortly, but to start with the dramatic side of things. Now, this slide shows you something that we found quite incredible when we first saw it. It draws on U.S. equity market data going right back to the 1920s, and the table on the left shows you all of the occasions on which the U.S. equity market has fallen over 30%. And the table on the right does the same thing, but for declines of over 20%. So you can choose your definition of bear market, market shock, however you want to describe it. The stark takeaway here is that the sharp decline we saw from the middle of February to the middle of March was by far and away the fastest decline of its magnitude in stock market history. When you glance down the list of dates on that left-hand side, you've got the Great Crash of 1929, Black Monday 1987, you've got the bursting of the tech bubble, Great Financial Crisis. These were epoch-defining market events, the kind of traumatic crashes that people write books about, that people tell their grandkids about, people study in business schools, and yet none of those prior instances were anything like as dramatic as what we've just seen in terms of the sheer pace of the market reaction. So make no mistake about it, we are living in unprecedented times. Obviously, we all appreciate that on a personal level, given the way in which our daily lives are being put on hold as the world battles this awful virus threat. But from a purely financial market perspective, too, we are in somewhat uncharted territory. So the market reaction has been dramatic. But as I say, it's also been somewhat one-dimensional so far. So this next slide is a fairly simple way to illustrate what I mean by one-dimensional. It shows where the pain has been concentrated thus far. The bars in green on the left are the eight best-performing sectors year-to-date, while the red bars on the right are the eight worst-performing sectors year-to-date globally. Now, given the incredible route we've seen in the oil price, no surprises that energy stands out as the hardest-hit sector. But as you read across that list, there's a fairly clear pattern. You can see that it's the cyclical areas of the market that have been hit the hardest. Banks, consumer discretionary, which includes automotive stuff, industrials, cap goods, mining, etc. Which is to say that the initial market reaction has been myopically focused on short-term earnings risk. The market has immediately marked down those names that are seen as having the most obvious near-term earnings impact from the widespread economic disruption. Now, you might think that sounds reasonable at first glance, but I would describe it as one-dimensional. One-dimensional because the risk to earnings next quarter or this year is not, in our view, the biggest risk investors face right now. There are at least two key sources of risk out there for equity markets that we believe the market in general is broadly ignoring thus far and isn't properly pricing today. And we believe the widespread neglecting of those risks means the current market situation and the trends we've been witnessing are inherently unsustainable. The two key sources of risk that I'm talking about are balance sheet risk on the one hand and valuation risk on the other. The the bull market we've witnessed over the last decade has in many ways been characterized by the gradual erosion of respect for these two crucial risks that history shows are hugely important for equity investors. For a long time now, it has generally paid to ignore balance sheets 
and it has largely paid to ignore the fundamental valuation of businesses and focus instead on other attributes like earnings growth, quality, disruption potential, basically anything other than the valuation of the shares. Now, we may be wrong, but we believe it's extremely unlikely that the market can continue to ignore these risks forever. So let's start with the first of those risks I mentioned, balance sheet risk. On the balance sheet risk side of things, in a, in a world of ultra-low interest rates, balance sheet risk has, has faded to the back of many investors' minds. Debt has been very cheap and easy to come by for most companies over the last decade, so it's become increasingly tempting for corporates to think that it makes sense to gear up, to buy back shares, to engage in M&A, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And generally speaking, the market has rewarded that kind of behavior, particularly in the U.S., but also in Europe to some extent. And the end result of that is that average levels of leverage, particularly in the U.S., but also across developed markets more generally, are far, far higher today than they were heading into the global financial crisis in 2007-2008. In the U.S. market in aggregate, if you exclude financials, net debt EBITDA on average is somewhere around two times today. It was only 1.2 times on the eve of the global financial crisis. Now, that will likely mean that a lot of businesses out there are more vulnerable to an earnings shock than they otherwise might be. But the irony here is that many of the businesses that have been hit hardest in the initial wave of selling, the ones that were sat in those red bars on the previous chart, aren't necessarily the ones who've been riding high on a wave of cheap debt. When we look at our holdings in the mining sector, in oil and gas, and even in banking to some extent, these are companies that are entering this crisis with far stronger balance sheets, far more conservative capital structures than at the peak of previous cycles. And yet, the market has seemingly not wanted to give them any credit for that. Thus far, balance sheet risk doesn't seem to have entered the equation. And we don't think that will last, given the scale of the economic threat that is now unfolding. We believe there will be a lot of businesses out there that will leave their equity investors vulnerable thanks to overly aggressive capital structures and excess leverage. Now, while the market in general has been very sanguine and relaxed about balance sheets in this cycle, we haven't been. One thing we always put a huge amount of emphasis on when we analyze companies is balance sheet strength. It's one of our core seven red questions, which is the checklist we use every time we analyze businesses. We ask ourselves, how does the balance sheet stand up to stress? Now, while I can't say that our portfolios are completely immune to balance sheet risk, frankly, they shouldn't be immune. We will happily take on balance sheet risk if the reward on the other side compensates us. We do strongly believe that the companies in our portfolio are likely to have much better starting balance sheets than your average company in the global equity market. And the chart on this slide helps illustrate that by showing how our portfolio, excluding financials, compares to broader global equities on three key balance sheet risk metrics. And you can see that we're starting from a much stronger position across the board. And we think this discipline will play into our hands in this environment as the market is forced to confront the fact that balance sheet strength suddenly matters again. It felt almost quaint, and it's made us feel like dinosaurs to be banging on about balance sheet risk for years when debt's been free for a decade and barely anybody has breached debt covenants in years. But we think that could well change as this situation unfolds. We believe the relative strength of the companies we own hasn't been appreciated by the market in the sell-up thus far because the market's been totally focused on P&L earnings, but we remain confident that in the fullness of time, our reduced levels of risk here will leave us well-placed to navigate through this crisis and ultimately outperform. So that's balance sheet risk. The other area of risk that I think the market may well be guilty of overlooking today is valuation risk. For an incredibly long and painful period of time now, it has appeared as though fundamental valuations simply don't matter anymore. The mantra of this bull market has been all about growth, all about quality, all about momentum. Don't you worry about the price you're paying. Just focus on the attributes of the businesses. And this chart next illustrates that this trend has now reached very, very extreme levels. Now, there are a lot of squiggly lines on this chart, so it's not very pretty, but it's a chart which illustrates quite dramatically the levels of valuation dispersion within the market, or, or 
to put it another way, it shows just how far the elastic band of valuation has stretched between growth, quality, and momentum styles on the one hand and value on the other. I would draw your attention to the dark blue line at the bottom, which is the value factor as defined by a composite measure of price earnings, price book, and dividend yield, and which has just hit zero in the last few weeks. Now, what does zero actually mean? That line hitting zero means that the cheapest quintile of the global equity market has never been this cheap relative to the most expensive quintile of global equities at any point in the last 30 years. Even at the height of the dot-com boom, in many ways, the bubble of all market bubbles, a bubble so bubbly it was almost a parody of stock market irrationality, we didn't reach the levels of valuation dispersion that we've reached today. The market has arguably never, in modern stock market history at least, been so blind to the underlying valuation of shares. It's no longer an exaggeration to say that this is uncharted territory for value investing. <laughs> Alternatively, if you want to flip this on its head and look at it from the other angle, the green, the light blue, and the purple lines show just how extreme the valuations applied to the highest quality, highest growth, and highest momentum areas of the market are today. At their 99th percentile, the premium the market is applying to these factors is about as extreme as it has ever been. And this is what I was alluding to earlier when I described the initial market reaction as one-dimensional. A lot of the selling pressure in this initial stage of the crisis has been aimed at sectors like mining, like oil and gas, like financials, like traditional media, where valuations were already at extremely pessimistic levels heading into this crisis. Whereas many of the areas that have been fairly resilient so far are priced to deliver perfect execution, ongoing smooth earnings growth. And no matter how high quality a business people think they've bought, everything has a price. Everything has ultimately a fair value. You cannot ignore and escape valuation forever. Valuation is the financial equivalent of gravity. It always eventually pulls company share prices back down to earth. So at some point, we continue to feel that the axe will have to swing the other way, that the market will have to wake up and realize that there are a lot of fundamentally overvalued companies out there that are more at risk from this kind of market shakeout than the obvious cyclical names where, frankly, expectations and prices were already pretty depressed heading into this and are now at extremely pessimistic levels. Now, I'm painfully aware that I'm running the risk of coming across a bit Dr. Doom here by just talking about the risks out there for investors today. But it's worth stressing that from our perspective as deep value investors on the Global Recovery Fund, this could be an incredible opportunity rather than a risk. And Simon will touch upon that by talking you through some of the opportunities that have already come about as a result of this market sell-off. But before I hand over to Simon, I'd, I'd like to make one last comment, if I may, while we have this chart up for everyone to see. As I've said, we've just surpassed the somewhat crazy levels of valuation dispersion at the height of the tech bubble. So it is worth reminding ourselves how that particular episode of market history ended. Global equity indices peaked in March 2000. And they entered a painful and drawn-out bear market period that didn't actually trough until three years later in March 2003. However, during that period, global value investors enjoyed one of their best-ever periods of outback performance, with the MSCI value index outperforming MSCI growth to the tune of 45% during that three-year bear market. Now, we don't know whether history will repeat itself to that extent. There are a lot of reasons why you might feasibly say, well, this time it's different. But it is worth bearing in mind that when the tide turns, it can happen a lot more violently than people think. There are a lot of people out there today who will tell you that value is still the riskiest place to be in this market. They'll tell you that the same sectors that have led the market rally for the last decade are going to be the safest port in the storm and also the best place to be for the next cycle. The vast weight of stock market history suggests that is very unlikely. We think it's fairly clear from looking at charts like this one where the riskiest areas of the market are today. 
and where investors are at most risk of permanent capital loss over the medium term. Now, value isn't an easy strategy to love at this moment in time. It's been incredibly painful, and we fully appreciate the difficulty that our fund's performance has, has posed for you and your clients. But we remain fully convinced that value is the right strategy for the long run, and that ultimately common sense will prevail in markets and value will once again enjoy its day in the sun. And on that, hopefully, slightly more upbeat note, I will hand over to Simon to talk about how we're approaching the current market environment to exploit the opportunities that we see today. Thank you, Liam. So this slide shows the percentage of global stocks that have fallen 50% from their seven-year high. It's a crude measure, but it gives an idea of the extent of our opportunity set. And as you can see, this is the best environment there has been for almost a decade. As a result, we've been able to make some extremely attractive purchases for the fund. Our overall aim is to try and take a balanced approach to idea generation. We don't want to just be looking at the really beaten up cyclicals with the most risk. We also want to take advantage of the indiscriminate selling in less economically sensitive areas to gain exposure to different types of businesses that have frankly been off limits for value investors for many years. And we have bought six new companies in the last few weeks. That is well above our average turnover levels. I'm going to give you a summary of each company we've invested in. For compliance reasons, I'm afraid I can't mention the names, but hopefully you'll get a good idea of what we've been doing. <clears throat> so the first company that we've been buying is an oil services stock. It's one we've been tracking for five years, but until now has never reached our purchase price target. It is very high quality. It's asset light and it has a flexible cost base as it outsources the actual work they do to third parties. And as a result, it hasn't made a cash loss in any of the last 14 years. Furthermore, it has a large gross cash position and basically no debt, zero pensions, and zero provisions. Despite that, it's trading below tangible book value on less than six times normalized operating profit and with a 12% normalized free cash flow yield. Those valuation metrics for a business with no debt, lots of cash, of high quality, and over 100% upside are outstanding. And that's exactly what we're here to buy. The second company we started to buy is a consumer staples business with a net cash balance sheet. It has outstanding market positions and makes high returns on capital. We were paying around seven times normalized operating profit and a single digit PE ratio for this high quality business. However, since we started buying, the shares are up over 25%. And so we have stopped adding to that. It is critical to have discipline in these markets. And this is an example of ours. Thirdly, we bought a tobacco business that we've been tracking for years. However, this is the exception. It has a less good balance sheet. We have stress tested it. We believe smoking revenues will remain pretty stable, and we think they will be okay. However, with a free cash flow yield of almost 13% and a PE of only eight times, for a global tobacco business, we think that means we're compensated. However, because the risk is higher as a result of the poor balance sheet, it is a small position. The fourth company is a U.S. mid-luxury retailer. This is a company selling mid-luxury items like branded handbags. They own its own brands, and they have an established wholesale channel selling these very well-known brands. We've been following this company for some time, as it has one of the best balance sheets in the sector. However, whilst this will be one of the last retailers standing, no retail balance sheet is bulletproof, and this, as a result, makes it a small position. 
But this is another example where the market has been indiscriminate in selling any kind of discretionary retail. And we've been able to buy the shares on a free cash flow yield of almost 15% and a PE below seven times. We've got very little in U.S. retail. We've been very cautious on the sector for a long time, but we have now added this. Fifth, we bought a hard luxury business trading with very substantial net cash and on three times normalized operating profit and a 50% discount to tangible book value. Clearly, luxury branded goods are a highly discretionary spend, and so earnings are highly likely to contract significantly in the short term, as they did in the financial crisis. However, with its substantial net cash, the company has an absolute fortress balance sheet, and in the financial crisis, they still managed to generate positive EBITDA and continue to pay a dividend. So it's an opportunity to buy a global luxury business with a fantastic balance sheet at a massive discount. Finally, the sixth business is an extremely unique leisure asset. It has basically no financial liabilities and has gross cash representing 50% of its market cap. Furthermore, it's trading on a 10% free cash flow yield and less than eight times normalized operating profit. Granted, it's going to have very little revenue in the short term, but in the long term, it will be a survivor. It's a truly fantastic and unique asset, and we will have bought it at an absolute steal with no balance sheet risk. So, with the exception of the leveraged tobacco business, these stocks all have something in common. If the world ends up okay, they've got massive upside. But if things get worse, they have got strong balance sheets, and so we are protected on the downside. Being able to buy these kinds of businesses, these kinds of businesses on a discount is the essence of being a value investor, and that's why now is such an attractive time for us to be investing. We don't know if this is the bottom, but what we are sure of is that in the medium term, returns from our portfolio should be very attractive from here. And that leads to some interesting portfolio construction decisions. When we can find new companies with substantial upside and low risk, it allows us to broaden out the portfolio, which is something we have always wanted to do, but refuse to do at the expense of absolute valuation. And again, this should be good for our clients, the ability to broaden out the portfolio. So the environment is good for new investments. It's excellent for new investments and for portfolio construction. But what about the current portfolio? Well, we believe the portfolio looks extremely attractive today, and the performance from here in the medium term could be superb. We have taken the opportunity to reduce the position size of some of those companies that have held up well, such as a Sanofi or a Morrison's, and added to those that we think have been oversold. This should also be very good for future performance. So the result of all the work that we've done over the years, the months, and the prolific and very hard work over the last few weeks is that the balance sheets of the portfolio are basically twice as good as the market average. And the portfolio is very materially cheaper than the market. If we look on an ex-financials basis, the portfolio is on a price to book of 0.7 times. That compares to the market on 2.4 times. The portfolio is on a PE of 8.5 times versus the market on 16 times. So very broadly, it's got half the leverage and half the valuation of the market. This should stand the portfolio in extremely good stead for the future. It's not been easy to hear. Value versus growth is at absolute extremes. But looking forward, we think the returns are likely to be extremely good. And with that, let's open up to Q&A. Perfect. Thanks, Simon and Liam. And uh, we've gotten quite a number of questions from uh, the listeners this morning. So let's start at... 
um, a, a fairly hard question, I guess. Um, you alluded to the fact that value has underperformed growth for quite some time. And thus far this year, that has not changed. So I guess a rather dramatic question is, is value investing dead? That's the first question. And I guess a more benign version of that question is, do you see any obvious value traps in the market? Okay. Thank you, Condi. It's Simon here. I'll make a few comments on both those questions, and then I'll pass over to Liam. So the first question, is value investing dead? We think it is almost impossible for value investing to ever be dead. And that is because, at its heart, value investing is very simple. If you imagine a house on any road that you know, and you think it's worth $100,000, all value investing is, is buying that house for $75,000 when people decide they don't like the smell. Whereas growth investing is falling in love with it and paying $150,000. You might find a greater idiot that is happy to pay $170,000 and $190,000 and $200,000, but it's still worth $100,000. So at its core, value investing is just regularly making sure you're buying things that are decent but cheap for a short-term reason. So we don't think value investing is dead. However, we recognize that it's been exceptionally difficult for a long period of time. The result of that is that almost everyone has given up. There are very, very few genuine deep value investors left in the UK and actually globally. The result means the bounce back could be even stronger than it has before because there's so much to go. The final point I'd make on that before answering the second question and then seeing if Liam has anything to add is that we don't recommend anyone has 100% of their equity investments in our funds. Liam and I have got that, as have the rest of the team, and that's not something we'd recommend for other people. So what we recommend is that people have a portion of their portfolio in value just in case valuations matter. Just in case buying a house for 75000 instead of 175000 when it's worth 100 counts. Because the weight of stock market history suggests when questions like this come in, is value investing dead? The opportunity has never been greater. It takes people to give up for the opportunity to arise. And so we absolutely do not think it's dead. Second one on value traps. We think there are a vast number of value traps out there today. In particular, areas which have too much debt, as Liam highlighted. If you're a good business, even if you're a cheap business, if you've got too much debt, the equity may be wiped out. And so it's critical to look very carefully at the debt. And if you're looking at a retailer, which is clearly a very cheap part of the market, it's important to look at leases as well, which are very similar to debt and fixed charge cover. So we think large areas of the market are value traps, particularly because of their balance sheets, and we're being very, very careful to try and avoid that. And we're encouraged that we're being able to find extremely attractive ideas with very, very good balance sheets, and that our portfolio has, on average, very materially less debt than the market. So there are the comments I'll make, and then I'll pass over to Liam to see if he has anything to add. Uh, yeah, thanks, Simon. I mean, I, yeah. I don't have anything particularly material to add. Um, I mean, the reason for me on the whole is value debt issue. For me, there's a very simple way to think about that. And the reason value has worked so effectively historically is because in the long run, the market itself is a value investor. The market does what value investors do. It focuses on fundamentally valuing businesses, the value of their cash flows, the value of their assets. That's why we have stock markets. In the short run, the market is a popularity contest. It can do whatever it wants. But in the long run, fundamentals have to matter so that capital is actually allocated efficiently to firms that make up the economy. So as long as capitalism is capitalism and stock markets are stock markets and they're fulfilling their social purpose, then value will never be dead in our eyes because at the end of the day, valuation should matter. That's the reason that markets exist. And because value investors always keep that front of center, in the long run, they're aligned to the way the market behaves. And if you look at that chart that we showed previously on on value versus growth, 
people who are saying that value's dead, if you, you can look at that chart and you can look at similar charts going back even further, and it would be an extraordinarily strange situation for value to stay at the zero percentile of the quality and growth to hit 100 and stay there for the next 10, 20 years. It would be completely unprecedented for that to happen. And quite frankly, it would mean that valuations would become so distorted and not reflective of economic reality that, that markets wouldn't make any sense anymore. So I think you have to embrace the fact that it's the moment where everybody thinks it's dead, where nobody can see the catalyst on the horizon that is the best possible opportunity. It was the same in the tech bubble. Um, so we remain absolutely convinced that, that you know value, value is still the right strategy. Um, that's all I'd add on that. Okay, great. Thank, thanks, gents. Um, and then there's another, well, in fact, a number of questions that have come up that uh, talk about the positions, the fairly large positions that we've got in financials and oil and gas, particularly. Um, I think it, it touches upon the point you mentioned earlier on around the cyclicality of these sectors. Uh, the question here is, does that the, the deep value strategy as the one we're following mean that it will work only when we see a V-shaped recovery? If not, does that, does that mean then that this strategy will keep, continue to underperform going forward? Thank you, Condi. Liam, do you want to take that first or do you want me to? Yeah. Um, I, I, yeah, I'll, um, I'll have a go on the um, on the bank side of things. Um, we are stress testing our bank positions as far as possible. Um, it has to be said that banks are better capitalized than they've ever been and are far better equipped to deal with a crisis of this nature than they've ever been. Um, certainly, if this had happened 15 years ago, they'd have been in far far worse position given the leverage they had at that point. Um, when we look at most banks we own, they've stood up to stress tests thrown at them by central banks, stress tests that looked very, very stringent. Um, and we've taken a lot of comfort from that. But equally, there has almost certainly never been a crisis like this before in modern society, where vast swathes of the productive population are confined to their homes for long periods of time. So we fully accept that historical recessions may not be a perfect stress test um, for how they'll cope in this environment. So we are alive to that risk, and we're watching closely to see how regulators think about capital requirements, et cetera, in such an unprecedented environment. Um, and as Simon has said, if the opportunity set broadens so that there are opportunities outside of financials, then we're perfectly willing to broaden the portfolio so that they're not as large a weight as they have been historically. That said, I think the point that you alluded to, Condi, is very important to stress, which is that we need to separate how these businesses earnings and future will look versus the valuations they had going into this crisis and the valuations they're on today. It's probably right that banks are going to experience pretty sharp earnings contraction in this kind of environment. But if the market was already pricing them to destroy shareholder value permanently, which they were in the vast majority of, of cases, then that is already in the price. So it's not. we need to separate out what's going to happen in the near term to the businesses and what's implied in the valuations. Um, I don't know if you have stuff to add on that, Simon. Yeah, the only thing I would add, and we've had a question on it as well, is as you're probably aware, all pan-European banks, so Europe and UK banks, have now cancelled buybacks and dividends. Now, that can be taken in a variety of ways. We take that in a reasonably encouraging way, in that albeit it's been led by the regulators, Preserving capital is far more important than one period's dividend. That is a more significant part of their future value. So banks that have got record high levels of capital, much lower leverage than they've ever had before, are now behaving in a sensible, cautious way. It is likely that banks are part of the solution, solution to this crisis as opposed to being part of the problem like they were last time. It is essential for the recovery of economies that, and the intermediate period that banks remain lending and remain available to the economy. And governments need to ensure that happens. And so I think it's likely that banks continue to function much better. But to the question of will value only work if the market recovers, I think the first thing I'd say is I think if the market recovers strongly, 
value is likely to be good. But trying to forecast markets and trying to forecast which factors will do well in which environment is an extreme, in our view, an extremely dangerous place to be. Trying to find the catalyst is next to impossible. I spent a lot of time in front of clients in the last few years, and everyone talked about all the risks that they could see in front of markets. And unsurprisingly, not a single person mentioned a global virus. Of course they didn't. The point being is trying to forecast when value or growth or quality or markets or regions will outperform is very, very dangerous. And that's why we believe it is far more important to retain a portion of the portfolio in value and therefore benefit when it does come good. In 2016, value had a very good year, and there were no obvious catalysts ahead of that. In the periods around 2018, December 2018, value had a very, very good month, and no one was able to identify the catalyst there. So yes, I understand the question that it could benefit from an economic recovery and inflation and interest rates. I think trying to identify it and time it is means it's likely to be missed. So again, I'd reiterate the encouragement to have not 100%, but definitely not 0% in value. Perfect. Thanks for that, gents. Um, let me ask one more question um, around uh, the performance of value in this environment, and then we can talk around the opportunities that you guys mentioned, the six opportunities you guys added uh, on, on the chat a little earlier on. So the question is, what explains the underperformance of, of value versus the broader market uh, of late? Given the, the, the stretched dispersions of valuation between growth and value, one would have expected that value would have protected investors a bit more than it has. Would you care to give your thoughts on that, Liam? I, yeah, sure. I mean, as I, as I kind of covered in the in the presentation, it's, it is, quite frankly, we were shocked at the idea that the cheaper areas of the market seem to have been hit hardest in, in the initial sell-off. But what I would say is that it could well be very early days in this market disruption. So I don't think you want to read too much into what has fallen initially. Um, as I say, I think the knee-jerk reaction of the market is to shoot on the basis of the earnings impact and perhaps neglect to think about what are the long-term valuation implications um, and what are, the, what are the prices implying today in some of these sectors. And I think it will take time for the market to assess some of that. Um, I think, obviously, a lot of sectors, if you're looking at value as a kind of style factor, then it's more exposed to cyclical sectors, so it's perhaps not surprising. Um, the other thing that I would say is that something quite similar happened in the great financial crisis in 2008, 2009. Value as a factor got hit very, very hard in the initial stages of that sell-off. But it's also worth remembering that it troughed a lot earlier than the broader market and actually started to recover before then. So I don't want to suggest that that's going to happen again. It's a sample size of one. We don't want to be trying to time these things. But it is worth considering that value won't necessarily trough in line with the broader market. I think that's something to, um, to take into account. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Ian. Simon, one, one for you here. Um, regarding those six new positions we've added, um, where did you fund that from? Was it cash holdings in the portfolio? Did you have to sell out of uh, other names? Um, and the second part of that is if, if you did sell, where did you sell? Um, and, and at what P&L? Um... Yeah, um, thank you. So uh, we funded it from two different areas. Firstly, the fund had quite high cash going into this, not because we're predictive geniuses, but we were just struggling to find new ideas. So we've used a significant portion of the cash that was in the fund, so that it was probably in the region of 8 or 9% cash in the fund, and now that's down a lot, so we funded it from there. But we have also funded it from positions that have been very good for us over a long period of time and held up well. So I mentioned Sanofi and Morrisons. We've reduced our positions in that. We've reduced our positions in Asus Tech um, and a, a number of other companies that have been pretty strong and 
I haven't got the detail in front of me, but I would have thought most of those would have been sold at a profit. Uh, the, when I say pretty strong, I do mean relative. Um, so we've been able to take profits from ones that have held up well, reinvest it in these outstanding opportunities, and we've also added to positions in the portfolio that we believe have been oversold as well, typically with good balance sheets. Okay, perfect. I'm, I'm conscious that we are relatively close to, to the end of the session, but maybe just two more questions from the audience here. So the one is, what's your view on consumer discretionary as a sector? Uh, it's been an area that's been quite attractive to uh, some of I don't know. Can I be heard? Liam, why don't you take that? Liam, you go. I, sorry, I didn't quite catch yes, the end of the question. Please. Was it consumer discretionary sector you mentioned? Cons that's right. Um, I mean, firstly, it's worth saying that consumer discretionary is a pretty broad bucket that includes quite a lot of stuff. But um, like a lot of automotive companies sit in the consumer discretionary space. That's an area where we do have exposure, but we've probably been slightly more cautious than some other value investors in the market, particularly around automotive OEMs, the car manufacturers. And that's largely because of, as I say, the, the stress we put on balance sheet strength and the, um, the desire to stress test those. The, the car makers have large internal financing arms, effectively internal banks. Uh, in, in many cases, the balance sheets dwarf the size of the industrial businesses. And trying to get your head around those reported accounts is about as challenging as any sector out there. So we've been quite cautious on automotive OEMs. So we haven't, we haven't historically had a large exposure there. Um, but we wouldn't rule out looking at them if prices fall to the point where we think that it offsets the risk. Um, but we have been more cautious there as part of the consumer discretionary sector. Um, and the other sector, of course, is retail. Um, as Simon said, U.S. retail has been all over our global screens for a long time. We've been very cautious in the past about having material exposure there. But there are a number of names that do screen, and we are reassessing them in this environment. Um, so we think broadly there will be opportunities in the consumer discretionary space. Um, we may have had less exposure there than perhaps some other value investors, but we're very much alive to the opportunities and we're actively assessing them, uh, as you'd imagine. It's Simon here. I'm not sure if Condi's on the line. The one thing I'm going to say is we've got a lot of questions that we haven't had time to answer. We will answer these, and we will send them round. We, we've got the list of people that are on the call, so we will answer them and we'll send them round. So if you have asked a question, apologies if we haven't had time to answer it, but we will do our best to answer them and to come back to you. I would just make a last few comments, which is we are acutely aware of how difficult this fund and value has been. However, we would encourage in the strongest possible terms to retain or add positions. It doesn't mean we know we're at the bottom, but we believe the fund looks extremely attractive here, and we believe that over the medium term, there will be very good returns from investing here. It doesn't mean we're at the bottom, but it means that we think the returns from here will be very good. That's what we're doing with our own money, and that's what some of our clients have been doing over the last few weeks. So thank you very much for your time and your patience and your interest. Um, and please get in touch if you've got any more questions, but we will try our very best to answer the questions you have sent us. Many thanks.